Good evening. It's Wednesday, October 4th. Tens of thousands of Kaiser Permanente workers take to the picket lines in multiple states today, launching a massive strike that the company warned could cause delays at its hospitals and clinics that serve nearly 13 million Americans. It's thought to be the largest strike of American health care workers in history. California State University campuses could soon be home to the largest undergraduate non-academic student worker union in American history. Over 20,000 student assistants across the CSU system will vote on whether to join the existing CSU Employees Union. President Biden announces $9 billion in student loan forgiveness, targeting 125,000 borrowers through existing federal relief programs. The move comes as millions of federal student loan holders restart payments this month after a COVID-19 related hiatus. A day after the stunning removal of Kevin McCarthy as Speaker, the House of Representatives convenes briefly today and then goes into recess. New York state officials warning that a group has been impersonating government officials harassing New York residents at their homes and falsely accusing them of breaking election laws. And as a path for additional USA to Ukraine appears increasingly fraught after the ouster of House Speaker McCarthy, President Biden is planning to address the nation on the issue. From Pacifica Radio and the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Maracle. Tens of thousands of Kaiser Permanente workers took to the picket lines in many states today, launching a massive strike that the company warned could cause delays at its hospitals and clinics that serve nearly 13 million people. The Coalition of Kaiser Permanente Unions, representing about 85,000 of the health system's employees nationally, approved a strike for three days in California, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington, and for one day in Virginia and Washington, D.C. Some 75,000 people were expected to participate in the pickets, the largest strike by U.S. health care workers in history. The Oakland, California-based nonprofit company said its 39 hospitals, including emergency rooms, would remain open. Donna Warder reports. On strike are licensed vocational nurses, home health aides, ultrasound sonographers, and various technicians for three days in California, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington State, and for one day in Virginia and Washington, D.C. Doctors are not participating, and Kaiser says its hospitals will remain open during the picketing and that thousands of temporary workers are being brought in to fill gaps. Kaiser and union workers can't agree on wage increases, and the union says understaffing is boosting. Kaiser's profits, but is hurting patient care. It also accuses executives of bargaining in bad faith. Kaiser argues that compensation and retention are better than its competitors. I'm Donna Water. As part of the largest health care worker strike in U.S. history, hundreds of Kaiser Permanente health care workers in Oakland walked off their jobs at Oakland's medical center to fight for better working environments and ask for better pay. Orrin Chapman is a striking member of the hospital's supply chain department. He said it's crucial to protest against Kaiser's bad faith bargaining because workers' contracts expired over the weekend. I wouldn't want to be here today, but I have to. I'd rather be inside working. I really care about our patient care here in Oakland. Most of these people do, but we have to come out here and represent, try to get our contract ratified. Danya Catil, a licensed vocational nurse, spoke out against working conditions at Kaiser. She said that health care workers are suffering from a staff shortage. 
But a lot of people are being short staffed, covering other people's work, not being able to take their lunches on time, not being able to get out for exercise. It's just very a stressful environment in certain departments that I walk in. Striking workers hope that the strikes will make Kaiser respond and guarantee quality care for patients and safe labor conditions for Kaiser workers. Faye Eastman. A patient care technician said she's determined to make her voice heard to assert her rights to fix the health care crisis. We're out here for three days, our three-day strike. I'm hoping that Kaiser is seeing this, Kaiser executives are seeing this and understanding the power in numbers, the power in the union, and the power in the people, and I want them to do the right thing. Come to the table and let's negotiate. Let's make a good contract so we can keep doing the great work we do. I've been here 15 years. I, want, I got 20 more years to go. I'm in here for the fight. I'm going to fight for my patients. I'm going to fight for the workers. I'm going to fight with my union. I'm going to fight for myself. We out here together to make this happen. In a statement, Kaiser Permanente emphasized the strike does not involve nurses, unions, or doctors, hospitals, and emergency departments to remain open during the strike which in California is set to end on Saturday. Kaiser said that it remains committed to reaching a new agreement that continues to provide our employees with market-leading wages, excellent benefits, generous retirement income plans, and valuable professional development opportunities. Their words. It also said that there's been a lot of progress with agreements reached on several specific proposals late yesterday. Kaiser Permanente Management and union representatives are still at the bargaining table. A source says meaningful progress has been made in negotiations between the striking United Auto Workers Union and Detroit's three auto companies. The Associated Press is citing a person with direct knowledge of the talks who said some offers had been exchanged. Another source said that there was more movement in talks with Jeep maker Stellantis with less at Ford and General Motors. Neither person wanted to be identified. Union President Sean Fain will update members on Friday on the talks toward bringing an end to the nearly three-week-old strike against the companies. The report of progress raises the possibility that the union may decide not to expand its walkouts at one or more of the companies. The union has so far limited the strike to about 25,000 workers at five vehicle assembly plants and 38 parts warehouses. Union President Fain has announced strike expansions on each of the past two Fridays. Ford said yesterday that it had increased its offer to the union, but provisions made public by the company were close to previous offers. The company said its seventh offer raised the general wage increase to over 20 percent over four years. It also said the company raised its 401k retirement contributions and confirmed profit sharing was offered to temporary workers. Those workers also would see a pay raise from $16.67 an hour to $21 an hour. Ford, which had made early progress, was spared from the second round of strikes and its parts warehouses remain open. Stellantis was exempted last week when the union added assembly plants at Ford in Chicago and GM in Lansing, Michigan. So far, the union has avoided strikes at large pickup, truck, and SUV factories, vehicles that are responsible for much of the automaker's profits. California State University campuses could soon be home to the largest undergraduate non-academic student worker union in American history. Over 20,000 student assistants across the CSU system will vote on whether to join the existing CSU Employees Union. They've announced that the California Public Employee Relations Board said they had sufficient support more than 8,500 union cards submitted to trigger a union election. The next step in the unionizing process following their filing a petition to unionize in April. At least 35% of student assistants across the CSU had to sign union cards as a show of support in order to trigger the election. Last year, nearly 50,000 unionized student workers at the University of California struck 
for over a month to pressure the university into negotiating a contract that addressed fair compensation, access needs, and more support for student parents, among other demands. Unionized San Francisco Unified School District workers have voted overwhelmingly to authorize the strike against the district. That vote last night, the Service Employees International Union 10 to 1 says the school district's classified employees like clerks, cafeteria workers, and custodians make roughly 15 to 25 percent less than other city employees. The union says understaffing and burnout have plagued the district for years. The union says the district has engaged in unfair labor practices in negotiations, which prompted the strike vote. A day after the stunning removal of Kevin McCarthy as Speaker, the House of Representatives convened briefly today and then went into recess with North Carolina Republican Representative Patrick McHenry the caretaker, Speaker Pro Tempore, serving in the job with very little power for the foreseeable future. Other Republicans left Washington altogether, awaiting the next steps. The House will try to elect a Speaker as soon as next week, though the timing is nowhere certain, as Republicans line up for their chance at the Speakership amid the bitter divisions that sparked the chaos in the first place. The House's number two Republican, Majority Leader, Representative Steve Scalise of Louisiana, is in line for the post, but he faced an immediate challenge from Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio, the Judiciary Committee chair and a favorite of the hard right wing, who quickly announced his own candidacy. Other candidates are expected to emerge McCarthy, who has yet to weigh in on who should be his successor, said today he's good friends with both Scalise and with Jordan. Sagar Magani reports. The House remains adrift a day after the first ever removal of a speaker. The fractured GOP majority has to pick Kevin McCarthy's successor. First, Louisiana's Garrett Graves says it needs to let the anger over his removal subside. Letting people go home and and kind of uh, uh, decompress a little bit's a good idea. Many Republicans have left town, awaiting what may be votes on a new speaker next week. Majority Leader Steve Scalise is in line, but faces a challenge from conservative favorite Jim Jordan. Are you planning to run for the speaker position? No, we are. are. Others are likely to emerge, and Texas's Chip Roy says the internal debate continues. We just need a strong uh, speaker, strong leader. Asked his advice for whomever wins. That's a public paper. While President Biden wouldn't weigh in, Senate Democratic Chief Chuck Schumer did. Think carefully about what happened to your predecessors. Saying John Boehner, Paul Ryan, and McCarthy coddled the hard right. Each of your predecessors got burnt each time. Sagar Magani, Washington. John Nichols, national affairs correspondent for The Nation magazine, profiled Republican Majority Leader Steve, Steve Scalise, the early frontrunner to replace Kevin McCarthy, for upfront host Brian Edwards Tickert. Steve Scalise is a, uh, a very skilled politician who comes out of Louisiana. He came out of the hardcore, tough uh political vineyards of of Louisiana. And and if you know that state, you know, uh, Republican and primary politics in that state, you know that, that um, somebody who's who's raised up in that, that political tradition is uh, a much uh, more aggressive, much more probably skilled politician than, than Kevin McCarthy. Uh, So that's, that's one of the arguments that Scalise people are putting forward. Uh, The other thing is Scalise is a hardcore conservative. He's at least as conservative as McCarthy, maybe more so. Um, uh, He seems to have done a slightly better job of, of keeping, you know, relations with the different factions. He is, yeah, as majority leader, he's somebody that has to keep the caucus in line for votes and stuff like that. And as such, he maintains a lot of lines of communication. Um, Scalise has some challenges. Uh, he was, I remember there was a horrible incident where somebody shot up a baseball game and he got shot at that point and, and recovered from that. Uh, now he's battling cancer um, and, uh, and I think doing pretty well. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is, this is not something he was looking to do at this point. And, um, and so there's a, a lot of sort of 
getting ducks in a row, kind of getting things organized. It sounds like Scalise is making calls, is trying to, you know, get the caucus together. He's the logical successor because he's the majority leader. And um, and so the fact that Gates says that the lease is potentially acceptable is probably, you know, for the Republicans, kind of good news, because it suggests that somebody who they've already accepted in a key leadership position is somebody who's also acceptable to their, their rebellious faction. And so I'd say that there's a good chance that Scalise at this point is the front runner. But I will remind you that there are members of the caucus who are proposing uh, to uh, make Donald Trump the Speaker of the House. Uh, there are also, I suppose, will be some. Oh no! Don't laugh. There was a Texas member yesterday who proposed it. Um, and explain and explain are, how that would work. The speaker does not actually have to be a member of the house. No, the speaker does not. Brian, you could. Are you thirty five? Or no, you don't even have to be thirty five. Are you twenty five? If you're twenty five, you can be the speaker of the house, right? Twenty five and a U.S. citizen. It's it's a very uh, uh, loose constitutional premise. Um, and so yes, Trump could be the speaker, but he can't be under the rules of the Republican conference because while there is no barrier to someone who's not a member of Congress serving as speaker, and by the way, there's been proposals for other folks who are not in Congress currently, like Lee Zeldin, the former gubernatorial candidate from New York, et cetera. While there are no barriers to that, the, the Republican conference has internal rules, and two of those rules are pretty interesting. One of them says, if you are an announced candidate for federal i.e. the presidency, you can't be the speaker. So, or you can't be in leadership. And so Trump would be disqualified there. There's another rule they have that says, if you've been indicted for a major felony, you can't be the speaker. And as you <laughs> might recognize, that's Oops. a slight problem for Donald Trump. Yeah, that's 25 of the Republican conference rules, which many people are familiarizing themselves with at this point. Um, so bottom line is, I, I don't think Trump is going to be the speaker. Um, but Scalise is a pretty competitive candidate. And then I think Patrick McHenry is, uh, you know, he is somebody who has always been tapped as a likely speaker. He's been in Congress for a long time. He's relatively young. I don't necessarily think he's going to make the rush to the speakership at this point. Um, because frankly, it's not that attractive a gig in many ways, but, um, I think you do have to keep an eye on McHenry because in that speaker pro tem position, he, he does, he, he, he wields the gavel at this point. And so I guess some people will look at him, although he started off by the way, if I can just add on a, on a very nasty note, although one that was probably quite popular within the caucus. And that was to throw Nancy Pelosi out of her office on the edge of the house floor. So he made a big mm. symbolic gesture of being mean. Um, and that's that maybe that counts for something in the race for speakership. John Nichols is national affairs correspondent for The Nation magazine. People lined up at San Francisco City Hall today to pay their respects to the late Senator Dianne Feinstein, whose casket was to be on display in the rotunda until 7 p.m. this evening. Following today's viewing, a memorial service for Feinstein will be held at 1 p.m. tomorrow on the steps of City Hall. That service was to be open to the public, but late this afternoon, Feinstein's office announced that because of security concerns, which the office did not specify, it was being closed to the public and open to only invited guests. The service will be live streamed. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Ukraine is pressing on with the slow-moving counteroffensive it launched three months ago to expel Russian invaders. Today, Russian military officials are claiming that they successfully foiled a large Ukrainian drone strike against the border last night. Charles de Ledesma reports. Russia says its air defenses shot down over 30 Ukrainian drones in a nighttime attack on border regions. 
It appears to be Kyiv's largest single cross-border drone assault reported by Moscow since it launched its invasion 20 months ago. The Russian Defense Ministry hasn't provided any evidence for its claims, nor any details about whether there were any damage or casualties. It also said Russian aircraft had stopped a Ukrainian attempt to deploy a group of soldiers by sea to the western side of Russian annexed Crimea. Ukraine's pressing on with a slow-moving counter-offensive it launched three months ago, even as uncertainty grows over the scale of the future supply of weapons and ammunition from its western allies. I'm Charles de Ledesma. A path for additional U.S. aid to Ukraine appears increasingly fraught after the ouster of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, with many House Republicans opposing more U.S. help for the war-torn country as they search for a new leader. Tuesday's historic vote to remove McCarthy as Speaker comes at a critical time, with a deadline for funding the government a little more than a month away and his opposition to aiding Ukraine's war against Russia slowly gains momentum among Republicans in both chambers of Congress. Leaders dropped $6 billion in new Ukraine aid from the temporary funding measure to keep the government open, which passed on Saturday, as they focused on passing it quickly, just hours before the government would have shut down. Congress will have to figure out by mid-November how to pass another spending bill to keep the government open. Supporters of Ukraine aid, including Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who visited the capital to plead for the money in person just two weeks ago, say it's essential that additional funding is included, but it might have to be sought in a stand-alone piece of legislation. The White House said today that President Biden is planning to address the nation on the issue. Sagar Magani reports. President Biden suggests he has a path around Congress to get more aid to Ukraine. Last week's deal to keep the government open did not include the $13 billion in supplemental aid the president's seeking, with several Republicans like Jim Jordan against it. The most pressing issue on Americans' minds is not Ukraine. At the White House. It does worry me. But the president says there's a plan B. There is another means by which we may be able to... uh find funding for that, but I'm not going to get into that now. So what would that look like? He's going to speak to this when he's ready to do so. The president and spokeswoman Corrine Jean-Pierre say he's planning a major speech on Ukraine and remains confident the money will flow, with top Senate Democrat Chuck Schumer saying most lawmakers are on board. There's strong bipartisan majorities in both the House and Senate. Sagar Magani, Washington. There are 48 hours left in the fall fun drive here at KPFA. And as usual, although not every day, we are trying to raise enough money over the airwaves to keep ourselves on the airwaves to keep the flow of news and information from this independent listener-sponsored alternative radio station on the air and available to you if you're listening to it now, and to the general public. If this station provides a service to you, if if the information and points of view and perspectives that our news and public affairs broadcast is important to you, and you think it's important to other people as well, to your fellow citizens, if the music that we bring to you, which really has no place in a capitalist marketplace, is entertaining and enlightening and inspirational. We're asking you to help us continue to provide that service by becoming, if you're not already one, or increasing your level of listener support. The number to call is one 800 439 Five seven three two, or you can do it online at kpfa.org. We've got just 48 hours left to go in the fund drive, and we're a long way away from our goal. We need to try to get as close as possible to that goal because it's not really a goal. It is, in fact, a statement of how much money 
we're going to have to spend in the coming weeks. It's a budget figure. That's money that's already budgeted to pay the bills to keep this station in operation. 1-800-439-5732. If you've been waiting to the end of the fund drive, we've got 48 hours left. You're running out of time. We're running out of time. Online at kpfa.org. Teresa in Tamales and Carl in San Pablo have combined their financial resources tonight to set up a matching fund of $720. That means your contribution will be doubled so long as we're able to raise an equal amount. In other words, Teresa of Tamales, Carl of San Pablo, don't want to be the only kids on the block supporting KPFA. They want to know that this is a community effort. It's a group thing, not just an individual thing. It's an act of solidarity. 1-800-439-5732 to join Teresa and Carl with whatever you can spare. 1-800-439-5732. Your contribution will be doubled. It will also be doubled if you go online and look at our thank you gifts that are there at kpfa.org. As is usual, I can't go on endlessly to try to get you to make a donation, to do a duty, to do a civic duty, because I have to bring you the news. And now I'm going to return to the news. President Joe Biden says his administration has approved $9 billion in student debt relief. An action, he says, will provide aid for 125,000 Americans. It's part of what is so far nearly $127 billion the Biden administration has provided as it seeks to make college more affordable and to put it in reach of more people. In his remarks at the White House, Biden also took aim at what he calls MAGA extremism in Congress, opposition to Ukraine aid and a poisonous atmosphere, and dysfunction in Congress. Christopher Martinez reports. President Joe Biden has long said that college should be a ticket to the middle class. Now he's announcing new action to make college more affordable. Today I'm announcing my administration has approved an additional $9 billion in relief for 125,000 borrowers in just the past few weeks under that program. With the latest debt cancel cancellation in total, my administration has canceled $127 billion in student debts for nearly 3.6 million Americans. This kind of relief is life-changing for individuals and their families, but it's good for our economy as a whole as well. Biden says the actions are fixes to student loan programs, a public service loan forgiveness program, and another program that links loan repayments to income. The action also cancels student debt for people with total and permanent disabilities. The moves come after the Supreme Court had blocked Biden's original student debt relief plan. We're on the verge of providing more than 40 million Americans with real relief from their student debt. The money was literally about to go out the door, but Republicans and elect Republican elected officials and special interests stepped up and sued us. The Supreme Court sided with them snatching from the hands of millions of Americans thousands of dollars in debt and student debt relief that was about to change their lives. As I said at the time, I believe the court's decision to strike down my student debt relief program was wrong, but I promised I wouldn't give up. He took a swipe at Republican lawmakers that have opposed his student debt relief plans, noting that some of them received pandemic relief for business owners. Let's be clear. Some of the same elected Republicans or members of Congress who were strongly opposed getting relief to students got hundreds of thousands of dollars in relief for themselves to keep their businesses open. Several members of Congress got over a million dollars, and all those loans were forgiven. The hypocrisy of this I find stunning. During his remarks from the White House Roosevelt Room, Biden also touched on other topics of the day, notably the recent chaos in the House of Representatives. <laughs> the dysfunction always concerns me. The programs that uh, we have uh, argued over, we passed bipartisanly, I'm not concerned that they're going to all of a sudden come in and try to undo them, although there will be some. There will be some, I'm sure. There's a half a dozen or more 
extreme MAGA Republicans, Republicans who would like to eliminate just about everything I've done. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that's going to get there. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre touched on the issue in her daily briefing. The Republican conference that we see uh, currently in the House, it is, it's, it's, uh, we've, we've, you know, we've never seen that type of behavior. They stand apart uh, from any other conference that we have seen before, whether it's you're talking about the Senate or the House. And so this is their creation, this chaos. Uh, if you think about it, this is like shambolic behavior that we're seeing from House Republicans. And so they need to figure it out. They need to end the infighting in the House right now. That chaos in the House could well affect Biden's plans on a number of fronts, including aid for Ukraine, which was cut out of the short-term budget stopgap. Biden says he'll be giving a major speech on Ukraine soon, and he says there is another means by which we may be able to find funding for that. But he gave no details about those other means or when he'll give that speech. Meanwhile, there's something else that Biden says will have to change. More than anything, we need to change the poisonous atmosphere in Washington. You know, we have strong disagreements, but we need to stop seeing each other as enemies. We need to talk to one another, listen to one another, work with one another, and we can do that. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. While federal student loan payments resume this month after a three-year pause, people employed in public service jobs have until the end of the year to benefit from recent repayment reforms. Suzanne Potter has that story. The Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program will forgive the remainder of your federal student loan after you've worked for a public agency or certain nonprofits for 10 years and made 120 payments. Jessica St. Paul is a physician assistant and an adjunct faculty community college professor in L.A. who helps run student loan clinics for her union, part of the American Federation of Teachers, or AFT. They can apply for public service loan forgiveness and consolidate their loans to get into an income driven repayment plan all on the same website, studentaid.gov. During the Trump administration, the Department of Education rejected 98 percent of PSLF applications. AFT sued, and now the agency has to review every single application filed since 2007. Reforms under the Biden administration mean people can get credit for the years they've already worked since October 2007, even if their loan was in forbearance and they had stopped making payments. Some of the most favorable terms expire on December 31st. St. Paul attended an AFT student debt clinic in 2018 and discovered she had the wrong repayment plan and faced the reset of her loan payment count to zero. She joined a class action lawsuit against loan servicer Navient that forced major changes to the industry. She says once the feds finally forgave her loans, it gave her the financial freedom to secure her retirement and focus on getting married and starting a family. This allows freedom for you to be able to live your life. You're doing the work for the community. I can still do that and not have to worry about a $1,200 a month payment for the next 25 years. This has changed my life tremendously. AFT 1521 members have achieved more than $4 million of student loan forgiveness through PSLF since March of last year. I'm Suzanne Potter. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It is an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 o'clock with a half-hour edition on the weekends. And I admit, it's not an easy show to listen to. (laughs) It's all hard news. There's no fluff. There's no chance to catch your breath. Go grab a snack or a beverage from the fridge. It's... Comes at you fast and furious. It's not to everyone's liking. It's not everyone's taste. I know that. And nonetheless, it has some listeners. <laughs> and if you're one of them and you haven't yet made a contribution in this fund drive, now's the time to do it. We've got 48 hours left in this fund drive. We're a long way away from our goal. So your contribution to get us closer is very important to us. Please give us a call, 1-800-439-5732, or do it online at kpfa.org. 
three donors thus far, Mark and El Cerrito, Deborah in San Francisco, and a listener in Berkeley who did not wish to be thanked by name. Thank you for your contributions. We're in a matching fund of $720. That's on the table. It needs to be matched. 1-800-439-5732. KPFA.org. Officials said today that at least two people opened fire during a dispute between two groups at Morgan State University homecoming events last night, but the five victims were not likely the shooter's intended targets. University President David Wilson announced late this afternoon that all other homecoming events and classes were canceled for the remainder of the week, including Saturday's football game. Wilson said the regrettable decision marked the very first time in Morgan's history that such events were canceled. Some students were seen leaving campus with duffel bags and suitcases this afternoon. Baltimore Police Commissioner Richard Worley said preliminary evidence indicates the shooters were targeting one person who was not among the victims, all of whom are expected to survive. Worley said a third person also pulled a gun during the dispute, although it wasn't clear whether that person pulled the trigger. He said ballistics testing will reveal how many shooters were ultimately involved. BPD SWAT, along with members from our federal, local, and other uh, jurisdictions, came to assist us as we cleared the buildings um, to make sure we could not, we did not have an active shooter. We did not locate the suspect at this time. The updates from police this morning helped quell rumors circulating online about whether the attack was racially motivated or a planned school shooting on the historically black university campus in northeast Baltimore. Michigan state lawmakers are moving closer to restricting gun ownership for more people who have been convicted of domestic violence. Farah Siddiqui reports. The House Criminal Justice Committee has voted to advance two bills making possession of firearms tougher in Michigan. The proposed changes would prevent anyone convicted of domestic violence from possessing a gun or ammunition for eight years after completion of their sentence. Chief sponsor is Democratic State Representative Amos O'Neill of Saginaw. Newly convicted domestic abusers should not have easy access to deadly weapons. These bills put the people of Michigan first by delivering more common sense gun reform. Michigan's current law restricts firearms possession for people convicted of felony domestic violence, which is rarely charged. These proposals include specific misdemeanor convictions as well. Backers of the legislation say more than 30 other states have similar laws and that these states experience 10 to 15 percent lower rates of domestic violent death. With a survivor by his side, attorney Heath Lowry with the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence told lawmakers that the vote means state leaders are listening to domestic violence survivors and taking their stories to heart. We know that domestic violence perpetrators are five times more likely to kill their victims when those abusers own a firearm. And these bills will reduce that danger. Survivors deserve the protection that these bills offer. According to the Michigan Violent Death Reporting System, an average of 70 Michigan women and children are killed every year with a firearm by their abusers. I'm Farah Siddiqui. The fraud trial that could block former President Donald Trump from doing business in New York drilled down today into the question of who his company or hired accountants bore responsibility for financial statements that the state calls fraudulent. With accountants on the witness stand and Trump at the defense table for a third straight day, his attorneys tried to pin blame on accounting firms for any problems with the statements. But lawyers for New York Attorney General Letitia James sought to show that the accountants relied entirely on information supplied by Trump and his company. Outside the courtroom, meanwhile, Trump's lawyers appealed a key pretrial ruling that he engaged in fraud by puffing up the values of his prized assets. The trial concerned six claims that remain in the lawsuit after that ruling. Trump denies any wrongdoing. The trial comes as he leads the race for the Republican presidential nomination. And the stakes are high for him and the real estate empire that launched him into public life. The pretrial ruling that's now under appeal could cost him control of Trump Tower and some other properties. At the trial, James is seeking a $250 million penalty 
and a prohibition on Trump doing any further business in New York. At the heart of the case are the statements of financial condition. Those are yearly snapshots of Trump's wealth that were given to banks, insurers, and others. James says the statements were widely inflated. His Trump Tower, the penthouse, was claimed as nearly three times its actual size, for example. And his Mar-a-Lago Club in Florida was hugely overvalued at $739 million. Julie Walker reports from the site of the trial in a Manhattan courthouse. Former President Trump returned to his New York civil fraud trial for a third day Wednesday and continues to say he's worth a lot more than the state says he is. Lawyers for the New York Attorney General who is suing Donald Trump went after the accountant who prepared his financial statements, which the former president insists were perfect. Not only perfect, the statements are much more conservative than my real net worth. My real net worth is much higher. The lawsuit accuses Trump and his business of deceiving banks, insurers, and others by exaggerating his wealth. They don't use the statements because it has a disclaimer clause. They do their own work. The clause tells them, do your own due diligence. A limited gag order went into effect yesterday after the judge admonished a social media post by Trump disparaging court staff and made the former president take it down. At court in Manhattan, I'm Julie Walker. And reporter Walker says Trump's unusual attendance at the trial is part of a calculated move to make his prosecution a part of his campaign for president. Donald Trump is not scheduled to testify yet, so doesn't have to be here, but he's seizing the opportunity. This has to do with election interference, plain and simple. They're trying to damage me so that I don't do as well as I'm doing in the election. Trump's appearances here drew far more media attention than any campaign rally would have and gave the former president a fresh opportunity to rile up his base and to fundraise. Reporter Julie Walker in New York. Opening statements began today at the fraud trial of FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried in New York City. Prosecutors say... Bankman-Fried defrauded thousands of investors and customers out of billions of dollars by siphoning off their money for his own uses. The 31-year-old was returned to the United States from the Bahamas, where he still has assets, after his arrest last December. Originally under house arrest, he was jailed in August after a judge concluded he'd tried to influence witnesses at his trial. He has pled not guilty. Sally Patterson reports from Manhattan. In court on Tuesday, Judge Lewis Kaplan reminded Bankman Freed he has the right to testify in his own defense. The 31-year-old defendant has been very outspoken throughout the past year, talking to journalists and sharing his ex-girlfriend's diaries with the New York Times saw him have his bail revoked. Arriving at the courthouse on Wednesday, his parents, Joseph Bankman and Barbara Freed, pushed their way through the swarm of reporters. Their involvement in FTX is also under scrutiny. They've been accused of using customers' money for their own benefit, claims they call completely false. I'm Sally Patterson. And here's some bad news, as if that isn't what all news is. But this is bad news about what we're trying to do tonight on the newscast to raise sufficient money to keep this newscast on the air. We are going nowhere. We've had three donors thus far to our matching fund. We're one-third of the way towards needing that $720 challenge. And we haven't had a pledge in 20 minutes. There are just 48 hours left in the fund drive. The news has uh, consistently underperformed in our efforts to raise sufficient money to pay our way, to pay our own freight here at KPFA, to cover the costs that it, that are entailed in producing this hour-long newscast each night. I was hoping maybe in the final hours of the fund drive we could do something about that, maybe (laughs) make a little more money, even things out, but it doesn't look that way, and right now 
were failing to make a match, which means that the amount of money conditionally pledged by uh, Teresa and Carl might have to be returned if we can't equal it, that total, with an additional amount matching it from those of you who are listening tonight. So, if I can beseech you, I will beseech you. If I can plead with you, I'm pleading with you. If I can whine the money out of you, please give me a call at 1-800-439-5732. Your contribution will be doubled or go online, the non-whine line. It can be doubled. But we got to make it tonight. 1-800-439-5732, kpfa.org. New York state officials warned that a group has been impersonating government officials, harassing New York residents at their homes, and falsely accusing them of breaking the law. It might sound like a scam aimed at people's pocketbooks, but it's actually part of a shakedown with a different target, voters. State prosecutors have sent a cease and desist order to a group called New York Citizens Audit, demanding that it halt any unlawful voter deception and intimidation efforts. It's the type of tactic that concerns many state election officials across the country as right-wing organizations, some with ties to allies of former President Trump and motivated by false claims of widespread fraud in 2020, push to access and sometimes publish state voter registration rolls, which list names, home addresses, and in some cases, party registration. One goal is to create free online databases for groups and individuals who want to take it upon themselves to try to uh, find potential fraud. State election officials and privacy advocates warned the lists could find their way into the hands of malicious actors and individual efforts to inspect the rules could disenfranchise voters through intimidation or canceled registrations. They worry that local election offices may be flooded with challenges to voter registration listings as those agencies prepare for the 2024 elections. Baseless claims of widespread voter fraud are part of what's driving the efforts to obtain the rolls, leading to lawsuits over whether to hand over the data in several states, including Maine, New Mexico, and Pennsylvania. In New York, a warning from the State Elections Board preceded the cease and desist order from the State Attorney General's office. The board said voters in 13 counties had been approached at their homes in recent weeks in an apparently coordinated effort by people impersonating election officials, in some cases wielding phony IDs. Residents were confronted about their voter registration status and accused of misconduct. As a major conservative policy group celebrated its 50th anniversary today, a coalition of pro-democracy groups held an unbirthday party for the organization, calling out the American Legislative Exchange Council's long record of undemocratic activity. Scott Baba has the story. A coalition of opponents to the right-wing agenda of the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, is holding an unbirthday rally outside a glitzy gala event to celebrate the secretive group's 50th anniversary. Vicki Harrison is a member of Common Cause, which is helping to organize the protest. Today we're going to be talking about ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council. They are celebrating their 50th anniversary tonight in Washington, D.C. at the National Portrait Gallery. So uh, Common Cause, along with many of our partners here today, will be uh, having a rally welcoming them and wishing them a happy unbirthday today because 50 years of ALEC is more than enough. ALEC is a collection of conservative state legislators and private sector representatives who draft and collaborate on what they call model bills. Those are cut and copy pieces of legislation that ALEC then shares with its members and other conservative legislators in state houses across the country, who then may modify and submit the bills as their own. 
Alec has produced a slew of legislation on a broad range of issues such as deregulation, cutting taxes, cracking down on immigration, loosening environmental regulations, suppressing voters, weakening labor unions, and opposing gun control. They're the driving force behind some of the most controversial conservative laws that have swept Republican-run states, including stand-your-ground gun legislation, right-to-work labor policies, and so-called critical infrastructure protections that criminalize protest against fossil fuel polluters. Savante Myrick is the president of People for the American Way, a progressive advocacy nonprofit. He said that as ALEC members celebrate the impact they've had on American policy, most Americans remain unaware that they even exist. They're, of course, celebrating that tonight. They'll be patting each other on the back in a very nice and fancy environment. Uh, and they'll be looking forward to what they've done so well over the last 50 years. It's turning out very cookie-cutter, pro-corporate legislation that they deliver to lawmakers to pass in state houses all across the country. We think the issue is that not enough Americans know that that's what they do. They see this legislation being passed in the state houses and they think, oh, maybe it was written up by my own uh, state legislator or at least by a uh, corporate interest in my state. They don't know that that same piece of legislation is being copied and pasted state by state. Lisa Graves is executive director of the political watchdog group True North Research. She said that Alec doesn't just draft conservative legislation, but gives corporate lobbyists undue influence on the legislative process. What happens at Alec is that these corporate lobbyists, these corporations, the special interest groups like the Koch groups um, and more, they get an equal voice and vote. That's from Alec's promotional language to its private sector members. They get an equal voice and vote on these bills before they're introduced in our state houses, before they're made a national priority for this pay to play operation. Alec's corporate members pay thousands of dollars or more each year for access to state legislators whereas membership dues from legislators themselves account for less than 1% of Alec's annual revenues. This according to tax filings uncovered by the Center for Media and Democracy. Jasmine Banks of On Coke My Campus said that corporations have a right to have a voice in politics, but not to buy the conversation. While we can grant the ground that it's essential for business to play a role in our society, their influence should never overshadow the collective voice of the people. Democracy thrives when there's a balance, and it's threatened when the scales tip too heavily in favor of the few, which is exactly what Alec operates to do. Alec's anniversary gala is sponsored by dozens of corporations, trade associations, and right-wing think tanks, including Philip Morris International, the Heritage Foundation, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and NetChoice, a tech industry group whose members include Amazon, Google, Meta, and TikTok. I'm Scott Baba, Pacifica Radio, KPFA. And here's the bottom line in our fundraising tonight. We are $450 short of a $720 match. If we don't get that $450 in the next 6 minutes and 45 seconds... We have to forfeit the $720 pledged thus far to keep this radio station on the air. We can't afford to do that with 48 hours left in the fund drive with us needing to raise tens of thousands of dollars to get even reasonably close to our original goal. We can't afford to forfeit $720, but there's nothing I can do about it. You can do something about it by calling 1-800-439-5732, or you can go online at kpfa.org. After two years of receiving federal subsidies, tens of thousands of child care programs across the country have now lost that funding. Part of the largest investment in child care in U.S. history, the monthly payments ranged from hundreds to thousands of dollars. That funding, which ended Saturday, was meant to stabilize the industry during the COVID-19 pandemic. Providers say ending it puts at risk millions of children and their families. One study concluded that half of all the providers are threatened in Arkansas, Montana, Utah, Virginia, West Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Mike Kempen reports. 220,000 child care programs in the U.S. were cut off from federal funding at the end of September. 
For years, providers have talked about unsustainable business models that generated only razor-thin profit margins. Now they say without additional money, they face the possibility of having to shut down. Deanna Artis, a teacher at the Living Water Child Care Center in Williamson, West Virginia, says it's important for children to have a safe space at child care centers. So they know that they are loved regardless. Somebody loves them. The Century Foundation, a Washington, D.C. think tank, says the existence of up to half of all providers in six states and the District of Columbia is threatened without federal funding. I'm Mike Hempen. No help thus far, no rescue for our matching fund. We're still $450 short. We're in danger of forfeiting some $720 in matching funds. Please give us a call at 1-800-439-5732 or go online, make a contribution at kpfa.org. New York City Mayor Eric Adams is traveling to three countries in Central and South America this week, in part to personally discourage migrants from making the trek to the city, where more than 100,000 asylum seekers have arrived since last year. His four-day trip and public relations blitz that includes stops in Mexico, Colombia, and Ecuador was the start today. Adams said he plans to personally deliver a stern message to would-be migrants thinking of applying for asylum in the U.S. and heading for New York City. Lisa Dwyer reports. New York City Mayor Eric Adams says he's traveling to Latin America to discourage people from seeking asylum in the city as it struggles to handle a massive influx of migrants. New York City has absorbed almost 120,000 migrants just over the past year, with hundreds still arriving daily in need of housing and employment. Adams says he wants to give an honest assessment of the situation and tell people in Latin America that the city's shelter system has been overwhelmed and is at capacity. Adams has made a series of urgent pleas for a shift in federal immigration policy and for funding to help the city manage the arrival of migrants. I'm Lisa Dwyer. Thanks to Anne in Sunnyvale and Timothy in San Francisco. We are a little closer, but we are still some $315 short of our fundraising goal of the amount we need to match $720. So we're still on the precipice of forfeiture of $720. Please give us a call 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. Army Secretary Christine Wormuth said today that her service plans to create a new recruiting specialty after missing its enlistment goal for a second straight year as the Army aims for a recruiting force styled after talent acquisition models used by private businesses. Sagar Magani reports. The Army is overhauling its recruiting in a bid to attract more soldiers. The Army says recruiting is its top challenge, and it has not met its annual goal for new enlistment contracts in nearly a decade. A key part of the overhaul will be moving away from the traditional reliance on high school seniors or graduates. Army Secretary Christine Wormuth tells the AP there will be a new emphasis on young people who have spent time in college or are job hunting early in their careers in a bid to target the broader labor market. The Army will also form a new professional force of recruiters instead of relying on soldiers randomly assigned to recruiting. Sagar Magani at the White House. The Supreme Court is taking up a case that could make it harder for disabled people to sue hotels for not providing enough information about the accessibility of their hotel rooms. The justices are being asked today to limit the ability of so-called testers to file lawsuits against hotels in Maine and elsewhere that fail to disclose accessibility information on their websites and through other reservation services. Ooh, thanks for Timothy in San Francisco, David in Sebastopol, Victoria in Oakland, Chandra in El Granada, I think we're on the verge of making that a match and avoiding that forfeiture. Thanks to all of you who made a contribution. 
Sunny tomorrow around the San Francisco Bay and warming up with highs in the upper 80s. Further inland, it will be highs in the low 90s. Sunny with highs in the mid-90s in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow. That's it for the news tonight. I'm Mark Miracle. Thanks for donating. Good evening. This is Alan Watts speaking on behalf of KPFA. First of all, I'd like to give my very grateful thanks to all those listeners who responded to the request I made some weeks ago for funds so that Pacifica Foundation could provide me with a tape recorder to make programs when I'm away from Berkeley. The funds for the recorder have now been subscribed, and so my hearty thanks to you all. That was Then This Is Now. Donate at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.